page six now reforming our elections and our values major votes on capitol hill this week some of which could have foundational effects not only in the u.s but also overseas house democrats passed hr1 on friday a sweeping piece of legislation that looks to completely revamp the nation's election system this bill looks to expand voting rights reduce money in politics and require presidential candidates to release their tax returns Meanwhile, on Wednesday, the House passed a separate resolution condemning anti-Semitism. No, this isn't 1945, it's 2019, and that measure came in response to anti-Semitic comments made by Minnesota Representative Ilan Omar. Democrats added a surplus of other language to that bill, including a condemnation of hate speech involving race, sexual orientation, and many other different factors. That measure passed 407 to 23, but 23 Republicans voted no because that measure was too encompassing and didn't focus on the issue of anti-Semitism in particular. Even though that bill did pass relatively easily, you can be sure that our friends in the Middle East were also watching with a close eye. Joining me now, the founder of the American Truth Project and Daily Ledger contributor, Barry Newsbaum. Barry, thanks for joining us tonight. So I want to start with this election bill first. It sounds off the top when you, when you hear initially it being presented, okay, election form, that's great. But are there partisan objectives to this bill? Well, there's a, a number of issues I have with it, not the least of which is what the uh, minority leader mentioned, which is this is their defining legislative moment uh, for the first year of their Congress. In other words, they're the majority party, and this is the most important thing facing America based on the fact that they gave it the big HR1, meaning this is their, at least at this point, flagship legislation. It's more important than North Korea. It's more important than border security. It's more important than health care. It's more important than immigration. And it's more important than what's going on in the Middle East. I'm shocked that the priority is now the Democrats desire to see the president's tax returns and the intention to give felons the right to vote. That scares me. I like the idea of more financial disclosures, but then again, they've also got the Congress paying for elections, and that is really a power grab. And it's interesting to me, too, because most of the time, this type of bill, the one that you first put out, is the one that has the best chance of becoming actual law. So it was kind of surprising to me to see that they didn't go with something maybe such as immigration reform, comprehensive immigration reform, or even infrastructure, something that maybe could pass the Senate and get signed into law by the president. So in a way, is this kind of making a statement that they're not looking for actual legislation that could be made into law, but rather taking a stance against something moving forward? Yeah, exactly right. Uh, both the Senate and the president have both said dead on arrival. It will not even be up for consideration. It's considered so horrific. So like you said, it's symbolic. It means nothing. It will never get debated. It will never pass. And it's over. And this is their flagship, at least for now. That means this was the best they could come up with uh, as we head into the election cycle. It doesn't bode well for the party at this point if this is their issue. And moving ahead to that anti-Semitism vote, uh, just to, to make clear, I think it's very interesting to draw the comparisons of the way that these two parties have handled different criticisms from within their own. For example, Representative Steve King got in trouble for some comments that he made to the New York Times about white nationalism. He was removed from his committee assignments. Ilan Omar, for example, on the Democrat side... Yeah, the... Go ahead. Yeah, the difference is appalling. These remarks weren't maybe bad. They were horrifically bad. Elon Omar has a history, a long history, going back because of social media. We have all the texts and the posts and her correspondence and her press releases of anti-Semitism going back 15 years. And unbelievably, I am so saddened that the Democrat-controlled Congress could not call it what it is, anti-Semitism, and could not get their caucus to support it. And so what happened was a terrifically anti-Semitic series of comments, some uh, literally in the last two weeks by Elon Omar, got watered down to a condemnation of anything hatred, which is uh, against blacks, against gays, against other minorities, against immigrants, and so on. Of course that will pass. That's like saying um, wealth is good, poverty is bad, disease is bad, health is good. 
That's how much teeth this resolution that they passed has. And Ilan Omar skates free. And the progressive wing of her party is loving this. This is the future of the Democrat Party unless there's a voter revolt, which is to say anti-Semitism in the caucus of the left wing of the Democrat Party is now considered acceptable and there will be no consequence. And me, personally, I'm horrified. And I hope most Americans are too. And I think it's very ironic that some of these more progressive members of the Democrat Party are the ones pointing the finger at President Trump, calling him anti-Semitic, despite the fact that Ivanka, Jared Kushner, they're Jewish. They've moved the Israeli embassy to Jerusalem. And of course, they're coming up with their Middle East peace plan. So really, the action by this administration doesn't yell anti-Semitism, at least to me. But Barry, thanks for joining us tonight.